great to have you on board as a user of QuitRoom and for this meetup. So Ross, just to start off, everyone loves an origin story. So we're just going to kick off directly into that, right? So you and your team have done an excellent job building Kawasaki Wealth and Investment Management right now, overseeing about 2.2 billion US dollars investments, which is pretty impressive. So let's hear it from you on how you yourself and your firm, what is the origin story and, 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 uh, and where you guys are right now? The origin story. Um, you know, I was always entrepreneurial. So when I started in the industry in 23, I worked for a company called Sun America Securities and we would sell retirement plans, IRAs and, and mutual funds. And, and so I never really worked in like a, you know, corporate environment. And I never really worked for a broker like Merrill Lynch or Smith Barney or, or the firms that were around at the day. Um, and I was lucky enough to start my career following a guy named Eli Brode. And Eli Brode was the guy who built Sun America. And he ended up becoming a billionaire and one of the most successful, you know, business people in America. And, and having that young entrepreneurial experience, but but also a little bit from a distance, but just watching somebody build a massive firm and, and really solve a, a need, which was retirement planning at the time, it, it gave me sort of a framework of thinking big. And, and I think there's nothing more detrimental to entrepreneurs and individuals than the limitations that we set for ourselves. And so I think there's a huge advantage when we're able to be around people like currently I I'm fortunate enough to be able to be around Elon Musk sometimes. And, and I was just out in Austin and, and, and when you see vision on a huge scale, it's very motivational on what is possible. So I, I had a pretty good career in the financial services industry until the financial crisis and at Sun America, which was then acquired by AIG. And so we were part of what was called AIG Financial Advisors at the time. And I was running several hundred advisors. Uh, actually, by the time I was 28, I was managing over 250 investment advisors. Well, at the time, they were brokers, actually. There was no investment advisors then. So when the financial crisis hit, it was like this moment of like everything that was will never be again. Kind of like the pandemic, but for finance. And so I... You know, my partner and I, it's, it started around me and I was like, okay, you know, it's time to start a new brand. It's time to go out on my own. And then, you know, my partner was sort of the top person who worked for me at the time. And I was like, we should team up and we should start our own business and start our own brand. The brands won't matter anymore. The, the AIGs and the Merrill Lynch's and the, and the Bank of America's and the JP Morgan's, people know that these firms don't really care about their well-being. And if we start as a fiduciary and, and sort of in hindsight, a lot of our thought processes and my thought process at the time, I, I guess people call fairly revolutionary, but it seemed obvious to me, which was we decided to build our firm instead of managing, you know, bricks and mortar, which I did. I had 15 offices to have one office and to use the internet and social media to grow our presence and to create the perception of being a large firm through having a great website. And then I had a college roommate from Penn who was a programmer and I went out, he was in Hawaii living a dream life. And I went out there and I said, come back to LA, let's build technology around finance. And, and I talked him into it, which was a miracle because he was living a pretty dream life um, because I knew technology was going to be the secret to us growing very fast. So how do we provide investment advice and scale? So that was the first thing. Like we wanted to serve thousands of clients. We didn't want to have a minimum. We have no minimum at our firm. So we have clients with $50 million and we have clients with, you know, $5,000. And, and we like to say that we provide the same level of service, no matter how much money you have as a client. So this was a big challenge that needed to be solved through technology, as well as active portfolio management in a way in scale that would give our clients better rates of return. And so one of the things that made us different from many of the firms is we didn't really want to buy models and we didn't really want to buy broad indexes and like we like buying stocks. And so, you know, I'm a stock guy. I buy stocks for my clients and, and we still do do this day own individual stocks as well as indexes too. But we're stock pickers and we've always have been. And, 
And that's allowed us to have very good results over the last 11 years, which have been wonderful for the stock market uh, up until recently. And uh, and so my style of investing um, has been fairly rewarded over the last decade, um, being an individual stock picker and focusing on technology. And so, yeah, that's, so that's our origin. You know, we were sort of born out of the financial crisis and and we were sort of born. At, we were the first firm on Facebook. We were the first firm on Twitter. We were the first firm on Instagram, first firm on Yelp, uh, the first firm on TikTok. We're on TikTok now. It's absurd what we're putting on tip, TikTok, you know. And so for us now, we're probably one of the most followed firms in the world. Um, and we have hundreds of thousands of followers, which I find amazing considering I talk about stocks, you know, like, you know, I'm not talking about sports. I'm not talking about girls. I'm not talking about anything that would be easy to get followers. I'm talking about stocks and, and I just crossed 230,000 followers. So, so that I think is pretty amazing and accomplish what I think our origin was, was to reach a large amount of people, try to improve people's lives and situations through helping them with their finances by having full transparency of what we do, uh, how we do it. Um, I, I put it all out there. All our trades are out there. I own Netflix. I'm getting killed today on Netflix. Yeah, that's right. You know, um, And that's fine. I think investors know we're human beings and, and we have very good long-term results. Um, but I think people really appreciate that an investment manager includes them in this process. And that's been a secret to our success. See, I, I love how candid you are. And you know what? I can see that even in your Twitter posts. I mean, no bars around that. And that's perfect. That's amazing. I mean, that's exactly what you yeah, want. Yeah, I wish I was 100% <laughs> right. Boy, that would be a lot easier job for me. It is, it is. But 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 I want to actually pick on uh, two things that you have mentioned there, which is basically you are a climate activist and you're a musician. Yes. I want to actually talk about that in terms of investment perspective that I'm sure because anything that you do and anything that you uh, believe in as a core, it does show in the, in the, in the company that you run and the company that right. your team runs. So how does that impact the style of investment that you do and the investment choices that you make? Well, one of the things I, I realized over my career, because I've been doing it now almost 30 years and I'm 29 years actually um, next month. And so I started at 23 and I started investing at 13. So my entire life of experience has been following markets. So I have this weird ability to tell you exactly what happened in 1997, what I was trading then, what worked or didn't work or 2007, or just pick a year, you know, what was good stock? What was a bad stock? I was sort of meant to do this, you know, and one of the things I realized was that there every decade there's like this theme that sort of ch shapes our society and a lot of it's based around technology for example and um and and it creates enormous opportunities for investors. So when I started in the industry it was the PC when I actually started in the business I was the only person in my firm that had a laptop and had AOL. This was 1994 and and I was told to to not bring the laptop to work that it wasn't productive. For real, we made phone calls. We wrote trades on pieces of paper. Every day I was on the phone trading, okay? And we were, there were no decibel points. It was in fractions back then, 35 and an days. eighth. Yeah, <laughs> I miss those days. I used to be a monster on the phone, calling in trades, 35 and an eighth. I'll buy it. I'll buy 2,000 shares. You know, they call you back with the confirm. Your OSJ would have to sign off on the piece of paper. And then you had a folder of your trades. That's the way it worked when I started in the business. And I looked around and I go, one day there's going to be a computer on every desk. And people laughed. And I said, one day you're all going to be using AOL and you're always going to have email and all this stuff. And people laughed. That was my first decade as an investor. And it was a wonderful decade because it was the dot-com boom. So I was fortunate enough to be there at the right time in the dot-com boom and made my first real money in that period of time. In the next decade, we moved to things that were more focused around the internet, like search and really the rise of mobility in the cell phone. Um, we invest in things like cell phone towers and T-Mobile and, and uh, AT&T and Verizon. You know, these were growth investments as everybody went to mobility. Um, so you had the utility of the internet growing and then you had mobility. And then in the last decade, we had social media and the rise of streaming. And, um, you know, now 
what we see as climate technology, as you know, one of the overreaching themes of the next decade. So as we've gone through the decades that I've been alive and doing this, by investing in these themes, I've been able to ride the wave. So I look at investing like surfing. So when you surf, one of the, I think, key elements is where you place yourself in the wave and what wave you take, okay? Like yeah. what wave you take is actually crucial to having a good ride. And so when you get a good wave, and you place yourself in the right place, you can go on a wonderful ride that can last a long time. And that's what we try to do with investing. And that's what we see now in the next decade with climate technology. Okay. That's very interesting. So, uh, so, so anything that you would, uh, because climate technology right now, I mean, if you think about it, it's a very, it, it's a vast area. And, and, and especially for people who do not have that much exposure there, where do they start? So, Climate technology, so there's infrastructure, like what are the things we need to provide, let's say, electric infrastructure, you know, a clean electric infrastructure globally. And then there's transportation. So we look at energy and transportation as two distinct opportunities within climate. So the first issue is how we create energy on Earth. And, you know, a 100 some years ago, we discovered that oil was a great, easy source of energy. And we created a whole industry around transportation with oil. And that industry created the original wealth of America. So the original wealth, the Rockefellers and the Carnegies, what, what did they do? They were in transportation and energy. So th- that was sort of like the secret to what built America. Like when you think about JP Morgan, what he financed was railroads. Like, so it was like transportation and energy have always been just these like bedrock industries of America that are the core for growth. And that's across the world. So any growing economy or any society needs transportation and energy to succeed. Yeah. And so that's, that's crucial. So. If I'm an investor and I break this down, first, I want to look at, you know, what is the source of energy? So we're building a new infrastructure around electricity. So who's really doing that and what's the best way to do this in a clean energy environment? And what our opinion is, is it starts with solar power. Solar power, to me, is the most obvious, simplest solution for clean energy, okay? And the technology in solar has gotten substantially better in the last five years. So if you look at five years ago, what it cost and how hard it was to put in solar to today and the costs and the returns to put in solar, it's day and night. So for the first time now in the last year or so, it's more profitable to actually do a solar farm than to start an oil well. Now with the war in Ukraine, that might've changed the dynamics a little bit temporarily, but in the end, oil is only profitable through conflict and things that elevate the price unnaturally because the actual natural price of oil would be much closer to $60 a barrel if it weren't for war or conflict. And those conflicts are created by the oil producers to make money. So don't be confused. Russia is financing its war through higher oil prices. They know, just like Iran and Saudi Arabia knows every time they fire a missile and every time they start a conflict, oil prices go higher and they make more money. So oil has become one of the greatest sources of violence and unrest in the world. And and why? Because it's super profitable. So as we build an electric infrastructure, it's a direct threat to the enemies of the world. So that's the other byproduct of solar. So now it's more profitable to put in solar. And it's also better for the world. Okay. So when you think about defunding Russia, okay, there's an easy way to do that is you get off fossil fuels. Okay. And as we've seen in Europe, Germany has no ability or desire to get off fossil fuels. And now that's being highlighted. Now, there are many other options that Germany might have like nuclear power. That's another source of clean or alternative energy that now we're starting to look at again, that has enormous potential. And because of our fears from events that have happened long in the past with technologies where weren't even half as good, we haven't built a nuclear plant in this country in 30 plus years. So when you think about alternatives to, you know, oil, we have solar, we have nuclear, and we have other renewables like 
wind and, and, and uh, water, uh, thermo, geothermal. And so when you look at all these sources, the idea is what are the ones that are going to be most pros- profitable and easily deployable? So we have an investment that we've made great money on in a company called Next Era Energy. Next Era Energy is the largest provider of renewable energy in the United States. And it started out as Florida Power and Light. It was just like a regular power company in Florida. And they were like, the future is renewable. And they took their profits and they started reinvesting in solar projects. And they now have become this massive renewable energy company and hugely successful. It's one of our core holdings. So, you know, that's one solution. Another solution is the residential solution, which is states like California are going to require uh, solar on every house over the next 10 years. And so residential solutions like Sun Power are opportunities. Uh, solar Edge, which are the inverters, which are the brains of, of your solar uh uh, array and, and project batteries, which are crucial to uh, storing energy. Uh, another area uh, infrastructure investment that is hugely, huge potential along with the materials um, and the commodities that go into all these things. So you can go all the way from the commodities so, all the way on through to the different ways we can deploy the energy. And that's the infrastructure side. So talking about the infrastructure side for a second, uh, because there was a question by one of the investors who was, uh, who's I'm sure attending this session right now. So it was more about the infrastructure, but now he was uh, connecting this with the, with, with EVs. Right. So now, uh, right now, I understand exactly why you're being bullish about, about solar energy. It completely makes sense. But where we are at this point of time, the charging infrastructure is nowhere it's supposed to be. Most of it is most of the energy that is being being um, uh, used at this point of time to fire up EVs are actually from fossil fuels. And as a matter of fact, it is more unsustainable at this point of time. So this is exactly the view from which uh, the investor was also coming up. The, to quote him directly, want to know more about investing in EV charging infrastructure. How can we do this? As well as in most of the countries, charging infrastructure is being installed in order to enable EV adoption. And the number of EVs being still low, maybe not in the valley, with a smiley, of course, and the growing ESG concerns related to battery production combined. I'm struggling to understand how exposure to the sector can promise gains in the in the mid in in the medium term. Yeah, so I've been spending a decent amount of time on actually charging infrastructure myself because I have been fascinated by the Tesla supercharger network and its value within Tesla, and I feel if it was spun out of Tesla as a separate company, it could be worth like tens of billions of dollars, you know, because Tesla has built such an effective and amazing network of superchargers, knowing that that infrastructure was going to be crucial to the mass adoption of Tesla. So there's nobody better at running charging infrastructure than Tesla. And the way the system works is amazing because it knows your car. You just drive up, plug in. You don't have to even put a credit card in or anything. It knows and charges you. And we've been looking at the numbers and I asked Elon this and he answered me. And Tesla's making, you know, 30% gross margin on their charging and a 10% net margin on their charging. And I think it's probably higher. Um, and then you think about scale, you know, 10, 12, 13,000 charging things, and they could probably double that. Um, easily. And all of a sudden this business looks amazing. Okay. Now the problem is the other charging companies. So the other charging companies, whether it's EVgo, Blink, whoever, the infrastructure that they've built isn't that great because things like billing don't even work that well on these things. And so there's a tremendous amount of service that's necessary on other charging systems and they're constantly broken and they don't put in enough of them. There, there wasn't the vision or commitment that Tesla made into charging infrastructure. And now that's being prodded on by governments themselves, like government funding. So we don't look at charging infrastructure with other companies as that great of a business on the short term, because it's kind of like gas stations. Gas stations don't make money selling gas. Gas stations make money selling Gatorade and gum. And so. I think, unfortunately, charging will be a similar business where like you make a small margin on your charging, but you put your charging in the mall and you're driving traffic to the mall. That's what they just did in the Caruso Mall in the Palisades. So they put in like 10 superchargers and I was like, yes, this is amazing. And then my wife goes, no, this is a nightmare. Now everybody sees it as a supercharging network and we'll never get into the mall again, you know. 
but I'm like, it's good for the mall. Um, so wherever there's a supercharger network, you get business. And, and I think a lot of business owners see that. So, so I think that's where there's value. I have not invested in charging infrastructure. I think there's more opportunity in the uh, repair and servicing of charging infrastructure than the actual infrastructure itself. That said, most EV use, this was sort of the argument around Bitcoin too, that, oh, Bitcoin is so bad for the environment. And I'm like, well, you don't understand where the Bitcoin miners are mining. They're not going to Death Valley to mine Bitcoin. They're going to Sweden where it's freezing and the cost of energy is low and that maximizes their profits. So only stupid Bitcoin miners would do it somewhere where it's coal burning fire at high cost. Okay. The smart Bitcoin miners. So economics drives decisions, you know? And so when you think about where are the most EVs in the United States, it's in California. Where does California get its energy? Most of it is solar or natural gas. Natural gas is not the most perfect form of energy, but it's a hundred times better than coal or other types of, of energy. So when you actually look at the real usage of EVs and the real sources of energy, it isn't being fueled by fossil fuels at all because in the heavy fossil fuel states, they don't drive EVs. There's no EVs in West Virginia. There's no EVs in North Dakota or wherever, you know, and so we, we've seen this correlation between clean energy suppliers and clean energy users and dirty energy people use gas cars. And that's what you see in North Dakota or in, you know, Nebraska or whatever. They're not buying EVs in Nebraska. Okay. So that's just where the sales are. And you're seeing the same thing in Europe where gas okay. prices are just so high. They're just so high. And so many of the countries went to, uh, hydrogen solutions, which are not that great. And they invest heavily in hydrogen solutions, but they're going to learn that these EV solutions through electricity are, are better and more economical. And, and I think these infrastructures are being built in Europe and Europe's super efficient about these things. And I think with the war and the high cost of energy, there isn't any greater time to look for alternatives than today. And, and that's what's happening. See, I, I agree with you that on the long term, there is definitely a lot of uh, things that would happen in the space. But obviously, when you look into the companies that are there, I mean, EV, for, for example, they just look into the, in, in, into, into the demand. Uh, the demand for EVs have obviously gone up because... Yeah, I mean, it's unlimited oil demand. Prices. Yeah, it's yeah, unlimited oil, demand. Yeah, and, 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 and also the oil prices going up, definitely it, it creates that requirement for oh, consumers absolutely. to look into something else. Yeah. And, and, and where are we right now? Now, if you're looking into this, I, I, I mean, Tesla is definitely a, an obvious winner of... Right. Of Tesla's EV like industry. our core holding that hits all of these things. And then now they're a robotics company too. So, boy. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> no, that is that is true. But but I want to know a little bit more. Let's dig deeper on this because we are talking about long term investments into right. in, into a specific stock, right? So if we're going to be talking about that, then we need to cover certain other grounds because let's look into right. every other industry. For uh, for example, Apple came up with iPhone, amazing. But then later on, if you look into it, Samsung has captured quite a bit of the market as well, right? Uh, being sort of. a traditional player. So yeah. of course, Apple. They still haven't has actually it. captured the profits <laughs> of the market though. True. So Apple captures 95% of all profits in the cell phone business. That is true. But as a comparison, now let's just look into the other industry as well. Netflix, definitely you are investing into Netflix as well. Now Disney Plus is there, HBO. So, so the whole, um, uh, the point being the traditional players are definitely capturing market as a day, as a days go by, as a years go by because they already have an existing followership for their for their products, right? And you can already see that Ford Motors is doing the drive around EVs at this point of time. So 10 years to 15 years down the line, do you believe that the, that the traditional players would be able to capture a bigger pie of this market space? Uh, I know that Tesla will definitely have its share for sure. I'm not questioning that. Yeah, so... Making TV shows in a streamer is easy. Okay. You go out Hollywood, you can find a bunch of kids make a movie on every corner. You know, um, there's no barrier to entry to streaming. Like I can start a YouTube channel 
and this is kind of what's hurting Netflix, right? Because like YouTube is actually what's hurting Netflix. It's like there's so many viewing options and there's no barrier to entry. There's only so many eyeballs and the eyeballs are now spread. When you look at a company like Tesla in cars, right? Like everybody needs a car. We know how many cars are sold every year and we know how many cars are on the road, right? So the question is, you know, well, can we make EVs? And so every EV from any company that's being made right now is being sold. So like if Rivian can make 25,000 cars, they'll sell all 25,000. If they can make 50,000, they'll sell all 50,000. The demand supply imbalance for EVs, there has never been a bigger imbalance because there's such a huge advantage, not only in cost, but in actual performance in owning an EV. So a Rivian truck will be much better than a Ford gas truck. Uh, a Ford Lightning will be much better than a 150. You see what I'm saying? So the question is, how much more right. am I paying for that car versus the gas version? But the demand is there. So let's just assume the demand is there. So no company that scales EVs successfully will fail. You see what I'm saying? Like if they yep. can scale EV production, the, the, the business will come from the gas cars. It's never going to come from Tesla. So n- somebody isn't going to say, I'm going to buy a Rivian instead of a Tesla, and that's going to hurt Tesla. What it's going to be is that all the people who own gas cars are going to say, I want to buy an electric car and which one I'm going to buy. And if these other companies actually offer models, they'll sell them. And that's what Ford has learned. This is what Porsche has learned. Porsche is learning this big time. They're selling a ton of take hands and they're great looking cars. The technology is okay. But when you go to the Porsche dealership, they say, this is not a tech vehicle. This is a vehicle for people who want to drive. That's what they say, but it's an EV and they're selling every one of them. And, and so who's losing? The gas 911 is losing to the electric 911, basically. So I think from a perspective of competition, one must fully understand that this market will grow so quickly. What percentage Tesla owns of that market might not change, but the overall size of the market will grow dramatically based off how many units can be produced by all the players combined. So the real question is, how many units can be produced by all the players combined next year? And if you can produce a car, I'm investing in it. So one of my investments is in Polestar. Polestar GGPI is one of the few EV companies that's actually producing vehicles in some level of scale. Okay, they did 29,000 cars last year. They're hoping to do 60, 65,000 cars this year. They're Volvo and Geely back, excellent manufacturer of vehicles. They have a great business plan. They're manufacturing new EV vehicles and now in scale. Um, And so we'll invest in that. You know, I'll invest in Ford if they can prove to me that they've got a better business model than the dealers and they can make these cars. But I want to leave you with this thought. Making an electric vehicle is not like making a car. Okay. It's not. It's like making an iPhone. And Apple isn't going to Ford and saying, making a car. Apple's going to Foxconn and saying, make me a car. Foxconn's like, okay, but we make phones, you know? So if you have a phone expertise, unfortunately, that doesn't help you that much because you got to make a phone really durable and drive. So what Elon's done, I don't think people fully give credit for enough. And because I was there on the front lines when we almost failed, I knew, I know how hard it is to scale. Elon says it all the time, how hard it is to scale. And this is a huge moat for Tesla. It's just a huge moat because I still, not one company has proven they can scale them. So, so Roz, this brings me to the other investor questions that have been flowing. Uh, so one is obviously, what is your 2030 price targets for Tesla? Because you're definitely, <laughs> you're definitely, definitely all in for Tesla. Um, and, well, look and, at and, it. And, look at, look at price targets. Which, which makes have sense. No, which completely makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. T- price targets have no value. You know, it's like, like 2030. Like, let's think about 2030 for a minute. Okay. It's yeah. 2022. Now, if you would have told me a year ago, there'd be like an all out war in Europe and that Russia is somehow getting away with like genocide on top of the fact that China is like locked down half the country over a few people with the sniffles. 
and supply chains are like the biggest mess I've ever seen because of this. It's like, I would have told you, nah, that can't happen. So I'm a big believer. Any attempt to even quantify what the future is going to look like is just like a misguided waste of energy, you know? It so it makes so, sense. So, so Ross, I, I, so I think the, be- the better question is, will Tesla be a dominant company in 2030? And the answer is for sure. How dominant it will be is the question. How dominant they will be. So, so, um, so that they're going to be a robotics company, you know, like they're going to be pumping out robots and all kinds of crazy stuff that people can't even imagine, you know? Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. In by 2030, what they are going to be producing, of course, there is going to be an idea, but in terms of exactly what it is going to be, yes, we, the future no has idea. a lot to say. And then, and then obviously you, you, you're right about the supply chain issues as well as also, uh, at the end, availability of, availability of, uh, materials as well. Right. Right. It will definitely have an impact. So that brings me to another question, which was about currently we do see that the supply chain concerns are more or less like a short term issue. No. But, but yes, the long term effects of that no. for investors. No, in no, the no. Sector. <laughs> no short-term issue here. So I have lots of people who do business in China, including my wife. And so China's real good at manufacturing stuff and, and such. But for two years, companies have been jerked around by a different policy. And, and the Chinese people call us from the factory saying, I don't know what's going to happen next week. We don't know if the government's going to let us work or not work. You know, like Chinese people are really unhappy right now. It's it's really hard on on their society. This this approach is not working. And so supply chains are being redone now. So companies would be yeah. negligent to rely on China now a hundred percent. And we we started this under Trump a couple of years ago when Trump just created all these problems and companies just had to look at other supply chains because of the tariffs and all the nonsense that was happening. And now we're like, dude, can I really rely on China every month for shipments of stuff? Because every day I get a different phone call about a different problem with the factory in China. And so companies are looking at alternatives and that's not going to change. I've got, I've been invited to like three or four factory openings in America. I've been doing this for 30 years. I've never been invited to a factory opening in America. And we're opening tons of new factories in America. It's wonderful for the American economy. It's bad for inflation and globalization. Okay. And so the supply chain issue is going to be a five year rejiggering of everything. And that's what I think is happening right now. We cannot continue to rely on Russia for energy and wheat and minerals. We cannot have a hundred percent of our strategic interests relying on China. And, and and I think everybody gets this now, including our government. And so companies were investing in like MP, which is MP uh, Mountain Pass is a uh, mining company here in Nevada that makes a rare earth battery materials and, and soon to be a magnet factory and, and production facility. And Biden goes out there and he's like, this is national security. Like we need our mines to produce lithium and produce more stuff. Because we just can't rely 100% on China. You cannot make an EV without China today. You just can't. Can't make one. Absolutely. So, so, the, so I the, don't think it's a short-term issue. I think it's it's a medium-term issue. I think what the world will look like in five years and the way we do business will be drastically changed. And it reminds me a lot more of the 80s that we're going to, where the West will do a lot more business with each other and the and the pariah nations and China still has to decide which way they're going to go. I don't, I don't think China's going to go the way of the pariah nation. I don't think they're going to go the way of Russia. I think if anything, China will hopefully move more towards the West now that they're struggling. Um, and realize that supporting these horrible governments just for oil is probably a short sighted strategy. And, and I see them making an even bigger push to get off gas and other forms of energy because they use so much energy. So China, I still see being a leader in EV technology and, and clean energy technology also just for their own economic interests as well. So I suspect that the world will 
be very different in five years. It will cost more money over the next five years to do this, but we will end up with a much stronger country with a much more wealth being kept here. And the upside for Americans are is huge, I think. That's very strong uh, views. And, and I mean, and, it kind um, of sucks for the emerging markets, I hate to say, but, you know. It makes sense uh, why, uh, and right now, the, the current supply chain and the pressure that it has put, uh, it makes sense for everything to be redefined and realigned to, to make it more, more uh, dependable. Because again, a, again, a risk in supply chain on even mid, mid, medium term risk is something that you have to seriously think about to completely redefine exactly how it looks like. Well, and that's why Tesla's building robots, <laughs> because they know that the future of labor in the United States is very expensive. So it costs us, let's say, 30 to $50 an hour for manufacturing in the United States. And so if I make manufacturing twice as efficient, then my actual cost doesn't go up. So maybe we don't get a high inflationary environment over the next five years because of robotics and technology. So so that's why I'm so bullish on robotics and technology as we make these changes, because the only way for us to keep inflation down will be employing more robotics and technology into the factories that we build here in the United States. Now, I was just at the Cyber Rodeo, and I just saw the biggest, most advanced factory in the world ever built. And I can tell you, it's amazing. It is amazing what is happening. And, and if you just go see it, it'll blow your mind. And uh, the future is bright. That is pretty interesting. Uh, so uh, because we are almost going to be running out of time, I'm just going to go into other investor questions. But this is an yeah. interesting topic, and we should definitely catch up on this offline after this some other time. Uh, but, um, but getting into one other question by James in here, would you recommend exposure to clean energy ETFs? What are your views on the ETF market in, in the space? Well, truthfully, the best ETF is mine, GK. Um, it does give you exposure. We're about 23% exposed to clean energy, about uh, 26% exposed to technology. So about half our fund is clean energy and technology investments like Tesla is current 11% waiting in our fund. And then the other half of our fund is split between a lot of different consumer type businesses um, and different you know themes that we invest in, like the pet industry, for example. So that's a great way to get exposure. And we probably have the best research and insight into the sector because of our relationships with Tesla and others. Um, then the second thing, we own a, a position in TAN, which is an ETF uh, that focuses on solar. Um, we own a, a small position now, a smaller position, LIT, which is an ETF that focuses on battery technology, but it has a lot of exposure to China right now. And we're very, uh, we've cut our exposure to China just on the macro risk because of their policies. So I think China is going to go through kind of a tough time right now. But I like the LIT positions as a whole. Um, and, and maybe over the next six months would be a good time to get in as China realizes their policy isn't going to work and hopefully goes to something better. So LIT and TAN sort of round out exposure within my fund as well, GK. Um, that gives you more exposure. And those are probably the only two ETFs I use in the solar clean energy space. There are, there are many other ones and I'm not going to say they're not good. Um, it's not an original idea. So there's many other clean energy ETFs, but I would argue that the ETF is not the best way to invest in clean energy because you own a lot of companies that are probably not going to succeed too. And so we've really been very deliberate about which companies we're focused on in clean energy and transportation. Like for example, we don't own Rivian and Lucid. And a lot of people are like, oh my God, it's the future. I go, listen, they can't make a car. I know, you know, I've been to Lucid. I, I, I talked to Lucid. I've given Lucid a hundred opportunities to show me they can make a car and they can't make a car. We know that right now. So we're just not investing in those companies. A lot of ETFs just own all the companies that give you exposure to a sector. We're much more specific in our holdings. I think we have six or seven holdings in clean energy total, you know. Um, and so there's a lot of plays out there, but many of them don't make money. Many of them are conceptual, like quantum scape, where it's like, oh, solid state batteries. And I'm like, by the time that comes out, Elon will have batteries that are twice as good, you know? So the 4680 cells are already super good. And so it's like, I think 
you have to do your work in clean energy. It's not going to be easy money. So Ross, uh, that's, that's interesting. And now, so there are three investors uh, who had asked this question, which is tell us a, about Polestar and their future in the U.S. Well, you know, one of my secrets is relationships. And I've been able to build a nice relationship with Alec Gores, who is behind Polestar, Matterport, and um, Luminar, as well as some others. We became close because I, I said, I'm the Tesla guy. I want to see your car. Let's see your car. And they sent me a car and I was like, awesome. And I said, you know, I'd love to invest in your company, but I don't invest in just any company. I want to meet the CEO. I want to, I want to like really learn this company top to bottom. He said, come out to New York. We're launching the Polestar 2. I want you to meet everybody. And I was like, I love this guy. You know, this is the, co- so when I look at companies, I don't just like buy the stock and sit in my office and look at charts. Like I actually go harass the CEO about his business plan, you know, and it's like, I want to meet these people. I want to have a beer with these people and see who they are. Like I'm when I'm around Elon and their team, like it is such an insight into the, the whole company, you know? So every company I invest in, I spend a lot of effort getting to know employees and management to really understand the culture and the dynamics of that company. And Polestar opened up the whole thing to me. So I met everybody at the company, the president, design, their whole business plan. I, I, you know, I've gone through a top to bottom, the, the Volvo people I've met who are super sharp, they've got the China connection. So they've got the supply chain issues, you know, I wouldn't say solved, but they have the best bet with supply chains because of their Geely uh, uh, investor, you know, it really gives them that advantage. And then what I like most about Polestar is they didn't try to do something different. They just copied Tesla. They built an app that's the same. They, they, all the cars are, are basically lineups that'll be similar to Tesla type cars. The designs are different. So I like that. It's something different. They didn't copy the design, but the style of the business, an app based direct sale business. And they didn't leave out the full self driving component because Gore's is also invested in Luminar and Luminar is the best solution for full self-driving other than Tesla's and Luminar is partnered with NVIDIA, which is one of our top holdings as well, which makes the awesome chips for full self-driving and Polestar has a solution for full self-driving that they're very confident about. So we're seeing the orders now from the, uh, the car rental companies. So that's what's happening with Tesla. And now with Polestar, which is when you have an app-based GPS, full self-driving suite of technology in your car, it's real, real valuable for rental cars because they can track everything you do. It's got cameras everywhere. Uh, it, it, you know, it's a super efficient and profitable rental car. And the rental car companies are short on cars. And they're like, why not just buy all EVs? So what's happening is at Tesla and Polestar is that every low-end version of the car is going to be sold to a car rental company. So if you want an EV, you better get your order in because you're competing against the car rental companies. So Polestar has these relationships through Volvo with car rental companies. They already got one order and I expect they'll get more. And now they're they're also a global company. So they're only met trying to sell 30% of their cars in the United States, 40% in Europe and 30% in China. So they have the global footprint already and they're using Volvo sure. dealerships for service and sales to back up the app base. It's just a perfect business model, great execution, not trying to reinvent the wheel, lovely car. It's a solid EV. It qualifies for the credits and they can produce them. And so if they can produce 60,000 cars this year, that's a huge win, huge win. And then Polestar's goal is to get to, I think it's about 250 to 300,000 cars in the next three or four years. And if they achieve that in profitability, we think Polestar is a $50 stock. Pretty interesting. Um, thanks uh, for your views around that, Ross. And that brings me, I mean, it definitely adds up. But, to but you know, questions. but Gores is a good guy. You know, he he's not a shameth. He's not one of these SPAC guys. He puts his money where his mouth is. It's his money. He He's a guy who makes money for investors. So I think the SPAC industry has gotten hammered because so many like kind of crooked people jumped into it. Gores is a legit player. And boy, you want to invest with this guy. He's super successful. Interesting. Thanks. Thanks, Ross. That is, uh, that's very helpful. And that actually brings to, that can be expanded into the question that John Rollins has asked. 
which is about what sort of EV stocks do you include in your investment portfolio? I'm well, assuming I mentioned- it is not just EV manufacturers, but also other industries affected in the EV transition. What industries are you in, are in your focus as well? So the whole well, thing. I own a little bit of this Arcimoto, which is, you know, little vehicles, little EV vehicles for government, for post offices, for delivery companies. Um, they make a fun three-wheeler, um, but they're inexpensive. It's like last mile solution EVs. So that's Arcimoto. Mm-hmm. It's like a four and a half dollar stock. They're a little bit low on cash. They got a new factory they just opened uh, in Oregon, and they're scaling production now. Um, but we love micro mobility and, and that solution. Um, when you look at the EV business, like components or really for us, it's batteries. So batteries is really the area of the business I think is most opportunistic, less so from the the mining side and more so from the manufacturer and production side, cell production, uh, chemical, there's a chemical process to make the metals into the materials needed magnet production, which is MP is working on magnets are using EV engines, uh, motors, sorry. And so the magnet production is, is super important and needs to scale massively. Uh, and that, that'll also be done here in the United States. Um, but most of the, Things that go into, when you look at an EV and you tear it apart, the biggest thing is the battery. You know, it's it's all about the battery. And that's where I think there's money to be made is in battery and scaling battery production. It's super hard to do. Very few people have succeeded at. Cell production is a great business that we will be cell constrained forever. We will be commodity constrained for some time. So there's a lot of money to be made in the process of making and producing Batteries and batteries are the most crucial element of transportation and um, energy because of storage. And so storage is really the secret to this all. And another reason why Tesla is so far ahead because they have the new 4680 cells, which I was just playing with. And it's like a game changer. It's just a game changer, these cells. It's literally like, I can't, I don't know how to compare it. It's like, going from an analog phone to a digital phone, but with battery technology. And most people just don't get this. They just don't fully get this. And that's why, I mean, Tesla is a highly valued stock, but parts of Tesla, like their battery technology, just aren't really fully valued in the company because people don't fully understand how far ahead they are and what that will do for their business. Absolutely. I mean, battery technology, We, uh, I was also talking to this one family office that is heavily invested into battery tech. And we're talking about the long-term in investment returns that you can gain by being active in that space. So, yeah. so it, it is something that is very interesting for personally for me as well. And great suggestion, uh, Ross, from your end. So we are coming to the end of our session. So uh, I think this one question that Amit uh, had asked is going to be very, um, is, is going to be the right way for us to keep it as a last question to end our session. But before we do that, uh, in case uh, um, there are a few other questions, but in case any of you uh, listeners um, have any further questions for Ross, please go to, you can go to his community in Quit Room. You can drop in the question. The community handle is already provided here in the comment box, so you can check it out and then and then drop in a comment. And in case you want him to do another AMA session, a meetup session for you guys as an investor, you can definitely request it. Of course, Ross, if your time is available, then you can fix it accordingly. To yeah, listen, if, there's, if people care, you know. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So I'll leave it with you to handle with the investors moving forward from there. But one final question, which is, uh, uh, so, so the question is about, do you see any stock bubbles in the sector? I would rather say, let's focus only on what stock bubbles to focus on, which might be problematic, and, and, and what sort of stocks to avoid and what are the key risk indicators for now? So, I mean, the market's been pretty brutal this year. So if I feel like a lot of the bubbles have been pops. You know, we got a, a lot of popping going on right now. <laughs> Some of which creates opportunity, you know, and, and other of which is just, it was time for these companies to come back down. I, so what I look to avoid is companies that have no path to profitability. So one of the things as an investor that I try to teach people and especially at my firm, and there are a lot of great ideas, 
you know, and there's a lot of companies that are working on great ideas. And, you know, what comes to mind is like, we've been looking at these like psychedelic companies or, you know, uh, another example where they're doing research and there's all this potential, but the companies themselves don't even really have a product on the market. Uh, biotech is a little bit like this too, where you're just kind of investing on a concept. And if the concept works, there's a lot of upside, but 90% chance the concept doesn't work and there's a lot of downside. And so yeah. you're, you're kind of betting is what it is versus owning a business that is maybe close to profitability, generating revenue, you know? So we spent a lot of time avoiding the companies that have great ideas, but are far from profits, revenue, or market. And there are many of those in the battery tech space. There's many of those in the EV space where it's like, you know, canoe, we've got this, a Fisker is a perfect example of a company that, oh, we have this design and our plan is we're going to outsource everything and we're going to go into production this year. And now we've got all these supply chain issues and I guarantee you they'll never produce a car. You know, it's like, they're just not going to produce a car. And it's like, people are like, ah, I have clients who are very close with Fisker, but I'm like, dude, I'm telling you, they're never going to make a car. It's hard to make a car if all you did was make EVs. Okay. But they've chosen to outsource everything. And that is not the way to make an EV. Okay. Actually, that's the wrong way to do it. Okay. So many of these companies will never come up with products. They will never come out. The technologies like companies like Quantum State, I bring to example, super cool technologies, great ideas, and their time frame is in the next five years. And as I was saying earlier, trying to predict five years in technology is a waste of energy. What's going to happen with traditional batteries in the next five years is going to be amazing. So will quantum states technology be that much better five years from now when they actually exist? And the chances are no. And so as much as these things have potential, if they're not selling products on the market today, I, I just, I'm not interested. Um, maybe it's close to profitability or revenue. I'll look at it, but, but beware of the, the concepts stocks, you know, the, the great idea stocks, you know, oh, this is going to be a great idea. Well, how many of them did they sell last year? You know, zero. Well, I'll pass. Makes sense. So I think investors need to look at companies that have real products on the market and, and real opportunities to grow their revenue meaningfully. We are looking at a lot of companies that could do well, but we just wait until they actually are. I would rather pay more for a company and know that their certainty of survival is much higher than make a little more money, but also risk, you know, a hundred percent loss or, or a pretty devastating loss. So I think it's important to find more mature companies, not per se the newest, greatest idea. Makes sense. And Ross, uh, great to have you on board. And it was a great session, especially from your end. Seems, uh, seems like you have all the right connections that you need in the EV industry and in the solar industry. And obviously what we covered uh, during the session was great. It shows exactly how post, uh, how forward uh, thinking you are, especially around solar energy and and around EV as well as also battery tech. So these were the three main uh, takeaways that we got around the long term investment scope around these market spaces and how you specifically are also very actively putting in money into that in, into that industry. So great chatting with you. Have a good day ahead, and and hopefully the markets are going to treat us better now. Yeah, they will over time. Thanks. Over time. Over time. Yeah. Great. Cheers. Bye. Thanks.